The man standing in front of me offered me an opportunity that changed my life. He said he knew a publishing company that needed a person to be the editor of a book on nursing malpractice. I made the call to the publisher, I introduced myself, and I discussed what was involved. As the editor, I would plan the content, find the experts to write the chapters, cheer them on, and edit their work. I signed on, and over the next year, I worked on that book. I had no idea this book would change my life. I got credibility and visibility galore. My attorney clients came to me because of my publications. My company made millions of dollars because of the cases that I received. People knew my name and they trusted me. And I wrote and I edited more books, 48 more books. Are you dealing with a frustration wanting to write a book and not knowing how? Do you have a vision of how your book would help both you and other people? Do you have a hint of how writing and finishing a book would change your life? Would you benefit from a quick start course to write your book? Join me at the Get Your Book Finished course. Here's the plan. I'll work with you for three months. We'll start the process over a weekend, and then you'll have a roadmap that you need to get your book finished. Stand up for yourself. Don't be like this guy who's laying in his hammock and it says, just do it now, later. A shirt I bought in Jamaica. Get your book finished. Go to patire.com and scroll down on the homepage to the section about the Get Your Book Finished course. Check out the details about my course and grab your spot now. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business, and I have with me today Marjorie Salson, who I met as part of um, a coaching group called uh, the Joint Ventures Inside Circle, Insider Circle. Marjorie is a master at communication, and I thought it was appropriate since this talk this podcast is all about written communication that I bring her on the show to talk with you about her books and her insights regarding mastering written communication. Marjorie, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure to be here, Pat. Thanks so much for inviting me. I know that you're the author of a book and you've also contributed a chapter to a a book that is a compilation book. I'd like to start, first of all, with uh, asking you about your first book. And can you hold that up for the people who are watching this podcast on my YouTube channel? She's holding up a book. And can you read the title for us? Yes, it's Empowering Business Owners to Overcome Speaking Fears, Whether You're Talking with One Person or One Thousand. Okay. See, my thing is, you know, I originally called myself a public speaking coach, Pat, but I didn't like that title because people think public speaking and, and they think speech. And I think public speaking is any time you talk to anybody other than yourself. And it's the same when you say you don't say uh, that when you're writing, you're just writing a speech, you're writing all kinds of things. So I uh, really changed my title to com communication confidence coach because people want to feel confident about what they're communicating. And whether you're writing it or you're saying it, you want to feel that you have the right message and that it, is, it, is, it makes sense, it's well organized, and it resonates with your ideal people. And so I, I have some tricks I'm going to share with you about how to write more easily and have your subconscious, that's my your secret weapon actually is your subconscious and how you can actually access it. So that's the book, my international bestseller on Amazon. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, we're going to unpack that. And what? the other book, did you want to, the other book, uh, this is a compilation. Sure. I won 50 authors in uh, this compilation of America's Leading Ladies, Stories of Courage, Challenge, and Triumph. And if I can brag a little, I'm in there with Oprah Winfrey and Melinda Gates, among others. So to be asked to have been in this book was huge, huge honor. And I'm really thrilled to be in it. 
You were approached then about adding a chapter to that book? Is yes, that what happened? Yes, I was invited to do that, yeah. And how did the person who organized that book come across you? Do you know what the connection was? Yeah, she found me online. <laughs> All right. That's another vote for the value of websites. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, actually, where she found me is that uh, I've been named both Top Speaking Coach of the Year and Top Motivational Speaker of the Year by the International Association of Top Professionals. So that's where she found several of us who are in the book. And I'm lucky that, uh, obviously, uh, she felt that I uh, deserve to be there. And what did you write your chapter about? I wrote my chapter about overcoming the fear of public speaking. You know, that's uh, on the list of fears, that's the number one fear. And there's a very funny YouTube video from Jerry Seinfeld where he points out that people are more afraid of public speaking than death. And that means that at a funeral, most people would rather be the body in the box <laughs> than the person delivering the eulogy. So, and the other thing about public speaking, my other favorite quote, I, I know we're talking about writing, but this is from a writer, Mark Twain, a lot of people don't know, he lost his book money in some kind of boondoggle. So he made his living the latter part of his life going literally around the world giving speeches. And he said that there are two types of speakers, those who are nervous and those who are liars. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, if you're writing a book, eventually you're going to need to talk about it. <laughs> Absolutely. And that could be the subject of a whole different podcast is how you right. market and promote that book to make it worthwhile and to make all the effort that went into it pay off. Yes, that's true. Going back to your first book, and I know we've touched on this so far, the fear of public speaking was your topic. How did you get interested in that topic? Well, my very first business coach said something I've never forgotten. Your mess is your message. I didn't talk till I was four years old. I was a shy introvert. I had a hard time sharing my thoughts and ideas. And I had to do a lot of work on myself to become a confident communicator. And so when I first started with the idea of going in business, I had been a volunteer for many years. I had chaired things and I had been president of things and I was a certified adult trainer and did workshops and so forth. And I think, you know, at some point in your life, it's important periodically to reinvent yourself. So after several decades of being a volunteer, and my definition of a volunteer, Pat, by the way, is somebody who gets aggravated for free. <laughs> somebody who gets aggregated, aggravated for free. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. So I have anyway, been a volunteer for many parts of my life, so I love that definition. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I decided that I, I would like to go into business. And, and because I had done a lot, I, I was trained as a teacher. I have a teaching certificate from Michigan, and uh, I taught Russian and French, and then I got a master's in audiovisual education. And uh, I saw this uh, community course for voice acting. And, you know, voice actors are those folks that where you hear the voice and you don't see them. They're the ones who tell you to watch your luggage in the airport and do commercials and cartoons and stuff. And I thought, you know, that might be fun. And then I got, you know, I, I took the voice acting, which I'm delighted I did. But then I decided breaking into voice acting is just about as easy as breaking into acting, period. But everything I learned on voice act, as a voice actor helped me help people make their uh, talks and presentations more interesting so that they don't sound like a robocall. Uh, but I decided, you know, to switch to coaching people about uh, communication. And when I did my market research pad, it was really interesting. Everybody I talked to said they wanted to feel more confident. I kept hearing that word confident, confident. I want to feel confident when I communicate. And I think it's as true for writing as it is for speaking. Uh, and the thing is with writing is that generally you have time to go over it. <laughs> and, and if you're doing the speaking live, it's out there and you're done. <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons people feel so nervous about it. But I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to help people. And because I'm a writer and a former magazine editor myself, 
I didn't want to call myself simply a public speaking coach because people think that's only giving speeches. And I think it's any time you talk to anybody other than yourself. And writing is a very important form of communication. And how not only what you write, but how you lay it out. I invite everybody who's listening to this, go look at your LinkedIn profile. Is that about section in what I call a big blob of text in a gra small font graphic school of design that the <laughs> human eye cannot read? When you send an email to somebody, or have you gotten emails that are this big blob of text? I will tell you, this is not how to write, but when you're laying out your writing, the studies show that people tend to skim. And what they do is they read the first line, maybe the second line of paragraphs. So when you labor over your writing and you want people to read more of it, make your paragraphs very short. Ideally, no longer than like about four lines. And then put a blank line in between so that people can very easily read what you've written. You've worked so hard to write it. You want people to read what you've written. So I wanted to stick in that visual piece along with it. Because when you're writing, you're not just, and, and when you're laying out a book, you're writing, if you're writing, a, whether it's a book or an email or an article, keep the paragraph short and people will be able to read what you've written much more easily. And I think that's a huge trend that we're seeing, Marjorie, as time goes on. Paragraphs used to be, the ideal length used to be 10 lines, and now it's gone down to at least six, or, or at most six, I should say, because all of our attention spans keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. That's true. That's absolutely true. So anyway, I think, Pat, when you invited me to speak, you wanted me to share uh, how uh, my, my secrets to how you uh, let your subconscious mind do your writing for you. So it sounds like a noble subject. Let's go with that. <laughs> okay. First of all, keep in mind that you do not ever have to have anything that I call or is called writer's block. The reason I think people get writer's block is they sit down uh, Hemingway, Hemingway, Hemingway described writing as sitting down in front of the uh, typewriter and bleeding. <laughs> but the thing is, I think re the reason people get writer's block is, is they think, well, I got to start at the beginning. No, you don't. No, you don't. You just start anywhere and just keep typing. I mean, in the old days when you could, couldn't do cut and paste, uh, I mean, I remember starting writing uh, and having it on a legal pad and then drawing a circle and then an arrow going here because this had to move there and whatever. Just write it. Just write it. Just create what a crummy first draft. And the thing is that when you know you have to write about something or you're thinking about writing something, all of a sudden an idea will pop in your head and you'll think, oh, that's a good idea. Write it down. It is a gift from your subconscious. Write it down. Because if you don't write it down and you wait till later, now what was that great idea I had? <laughs> Ooh, your subconscious will not give that gift back to you. Always write down any idea you have, even if it is not fitting with what you're writing right then. In fact, you might want to keep a notebook or, a, uh, or just... I used to keep a, a, one of those three-sided files and write things on, you know, on three-by-five cards or pieces of paper and throw it in there and then periodically dig it out because you will get some great ideas that way. And when you actually sit down to write, just you, you've got two sides of your brain. You've got the creative side and you've got the editorial side. When you are engaging the, edit, the creative side, just tell the editor to shut up. There is nothing that's going to slow you down faster and frustrate you more and turn off your creative juices than trying to edit yourself 
as you're creating. Just create. Don't and don't worry, by the way, about the big blobs of text in the small font. If stream of consciousness works for you, do it. Uh, just write it. It's it's your kind of sloppy, crummy, whatever first draft. And it's so tempting to get into the editing mode. It's like a siren song that says, oh, Marjorie, you could revise this sentence and get rid of the passive voice if you just do a little <laughs> fiddling instead of writing the rest of it. Just make it perfect now. Now, listen, Pat, if, you think, if you're writing and you think of a better way to write something, then just write it. Just keep writing it. Let it be, come out of your creative brain. and then. Let it rest. Let it rest. And then, then you can go back and then play around and bring out the editor. And one of the things that you can do that I find really uh, a marvelous way to edit my own stuff is I read it aloud. It's interesting because one of the reasons I do that is because for some reason, I'm always writing of when I mean to or, you know, of to and I, yeah, I mix up, you know, my prepositions and they're always crazy. So, mm -hmm. and, and the thing is when you read something and you just read it over visually, your eye skips right over anything that doesn't, you know, sound right. When you read what you've written aloud and you hear yourself saying it, you can hear whether it sounds good to you. You can hear whether it makes sense. You can hear if you, in my case, put to where you meant of or of where you meant to. Editing your own stuff aloud is to me the best way to do your own editing. Now granted, you want a, a professional editor if you're doing a book because that's a whole other level. But you don't have to have all kinds of you know, messy stuff that causes your editor to do a lot of extra work, which ends up costing you more money for the editing. And you want it to, uh, you want whatever you write to sound like it's in your voice. And the only way you really know if it sounds like it's in your voice, if you say it aloud. So letting your subconscious help you. And by the way, What's interesting when you're editing and saying it aloud, that allow your creative brain, you will start channeling all kinds of good stuff that will come from your, the creative side of your brain as you're editing. It's amazing how that works. And as long as you're not beating yourself up by, oh, I can't believe I said it that way. No, forget it. When you read, read something aloud and it doesn't quite flow the way you want, then Play around with it. Say it a few different ways until you like it, and then write it out. I want to go back, Marjorie, to something that you just said that is a thought that circles around in my brain at times, and that is preserving your own voice when you're writing. I think that that works for the majority of people who can formulate sentences and be coherent and clear, but there are some people whose voice is not coherent, who speak in a disjointed way, who are disorganized or not using English properly. And I think that they benefit of all of the population. This is my opinion, and I'm, I'm curious to see if you see it this way. But they really benefit from having an editor because their voice sounds normal to them. That's the way that they speak and the way that they write. And yet, they're violating a lot of rules of English. So tell me about how far do we as editors go to helping people preserve their own voice when their own voice is not that good to begin with? Let me just be blunt. <laughs> okay, so speaking as a former magazine editor who had to do, <laughs> she had to walk, walk this narrow line, right. cross this very narrow bridge. Uh, first of all, let me explain my bias. I'm a former language teacher. It annoys me no end when people use incorrect grammar. And so I think when you're the editor of somebody whose grammar is bad, 
I think what, one of the things you might want to do is say, this is my standard of editing. My standard of editing is correct grammar and correct usage. And if that is something that is important to you, I will do that. If it's not, maybe you better find another editor. <laughs> I mean, you know, if it's going to really, you know, be so, you know, some people are not a good fit. There are some people who are not a good fit to work with me. I work with people who need one of two, one, one or all of three things, uh, which is what I consider the three-legged stool of effective communication. What, how, and allow. What's your message? Does it make sense? How are you either writing it or saying it? Uh, are you doing, if you're speaking it, are you doing it in, with an interesting way of speaking it? And if you're writing it, are you writing it so that it's easy for people to read, like we were talking about, not a big blob of text? Uh, and the, the third piece is, are you allowing yourself to do it, getting over the fear? And so I help people with all of those. And with somebody who's, uh, and they're not, not everybody is a good fit for me. If somebody uh, is not open to getting help or, you know, or, you know, there has to be, a, when you are working with somebody on something that's their baby, <laughs> you, it's got to be a good fit. And uh, if you, I don't know about you, but if you start working with somebody and you start dreading <laughs> and you wish you could fire this client, <laughs> that's, maybe, maybe that's, that's somebody who needs to work with somebody who is not as, as particular and who does not hold that high standard of, of language. On the other hand, if you tell somebody up front, listen, this is the way I operate. Everything that comes, uh, you know, that has my imprimatur is, has correct usage and, uh, and makes sure that I'm not going to change your ideas but I am going to change how you express them if they're incorrectly expressed. And so I would just ask permission right ahead of time with somebody like that and let them know up front. And if they're not willing to, uh, you know, I have to tell you, my sister, this is, my sister once said to me, will you stop correcting my grammar? <laughs> this is where this advice comes from, by the way, Pat. And I, I decided my relationship with her was more important <laughs> than, mm -hmm. than, yeah. But if it's not somebody like that, then you have to decide, is this somebody that you, you, who is open to the kind of gift that you provide? When you are editing somebody, you are giving them the gift of your mind, your heart, your understanding, your wisdom. And if they're not open to that, they're not, they're not your person. Sorry to tough love, <laughs> offer a little tough love. Well, it, and it's a reflection on that person's professional credibility and authority that what they have put together in the form of a paper or a report is accurate. I know this territory well, Marjorie, because I had a business for 28 years supplying expert witnesses. And after a disastrous experience with an expert who couldn't write simple English, ah. I decided that I needed to proofread all of my experts' reports before they went to the attorney. When the attorney is calling you up and saying, Pat, did you see this report before she sent it to you? You know that's not a good question, that there's yeah. going to be more to that story. So the vast majority of experts whose reports I at proofread and then employees within my company proofread the experts appreciated the changes but I do have a vivid memory of a woman who got highly affronted in all caps exclamations bold size 18 font that anyone would do anything to her masterpiece it cost her thousands of dollars of work that she would have gotten from my company if she had been open to the idea that her reports were disorganized, they didn't include full sentences, they weren't coherent, 
she didn't see those flaws and she got so upset with me that she said, I'll never take any more work from your company again. And I thought, good. Yeah. Yeah. You're not hurting me by doing that. You're hurting yourself. But we parted ways. She accepted 97, 98% of the changes that I suggested that she put in her report. And then we stopped giving her work. So you can have a direct financial impact by not being coachable or willing to accept another viewpoint or recognize that you need to make some changes so that other people will understand what you've put in writing. The other thing I think is really important, uh, before you ever start writing anything, it helps to have an outline of, of what do you really want to share? I mean, if there are, if when you're, when somebody's giving a talk, I, I recommend not more than three points because people aren't going to remember them. And uh, my basic outline is to find a, a wonderful opening sentence, tell people what, you, that you're going to be covering these three points, then say the first this point, second that point, third this point, and then say, uh, I shared these three things with you, and then have a wonderful closing sentence. And what happens when you're writing? One of the reasons people, you know, get the writer's block is they think they have to start out with this fabulous first sentence. The fact is that when you're in the middle of writing, uh, whatever, all of a sudden a great opening or closing sentence may just uh, pop right into your brain. So write right. it down immediately so you don't forget it. Right. Any gift you get from your subconscious, write down immediately because it, it could disappear and you might never get it back. But, but that's, that's the two things I would say. Listen to your subconscious and don't think you have to start in the, at the beginning. Just start writing. Oh, well, it's more than two things, actually. Uh, edit, keep your editor quiet. Editor sticks nose and shut up. Shut up. We are creating now. You will have your turn. <laughs> And, and then read you, whatever you've got aloud. And, you, and then you'll hear the things that, uh, you know, that don't quite make sense. It's amazing how your eye just floats right past all kinds of craziness. And the minute you read it aloud, you think, ooh. <laughs> uh, so so you, you can do a lot of your own editing. And, and when you read it aloud is when you'll get a lot of other good ideas to include. Wow, that was such a nice summary, Marjorie. You told us what you're going to tell us, you told us, and then you told us what you told us. <laughs> I think I've seen that formula used once or it, twice before. Yeah, well, well the, I just read a statistic that we tend to remember after three days about 5% of what we heard presented orally. That's why it's important if something's important. Write out the notes. <laughs> so you, and you know, what's interesting, and writing in with your hand rather than, you know, typing, tends to help you remember things much better, even if you never reread the notes. It's, it's involving your sight, your hearing, and the kinesthetic, actually using your, uh, you know, your body to uh, reinforce what you're learning. You know, I always take written notes when I'm listening to a talk or I'm involved in a virtual conference and I feel like it helps me understand what I'm hearing better when I'm writing those key points in my notebook and I think you're right I very rarely go back and look at it but I feel like I'm absorbing it better when Absolutely. I'm writing it down. It, for, it forces your brain to listen more carefully and it helps imprint the ideas in your mind. You know and another interesting thing that comes out of that Marjorie is that if we have such poor retention and we are both marketers and we're both sharing information with people. We have to think about how our learners absorb information. For example, I just completed a four day conference and we are as part of the package selling the video recordings, the audio recordings and the transcripts. And my co-planner and I talked about, well, are transcripts really necessary? And I said, yes, I think they are for the people who want to be able to go back and refer to that 95% of the content that they forgot, but they don't want to listen to 
an audio to find that five minute segment where they really had key points they wanted to refer to, or they don't have the time to sit through watching a video again. To me, a transcript makes perfect sense to be able to quickly locate information. I Has that been your experience? I underline, I highlight, I put arrows, I put <laughs> asterisks, <laughs> margin. Yeah, I, I love transcripts. Perfect. Well, then we see eye to eye, which is always reassuring. I love to talk to people who I see eye to eye with. Yeah. Well, how can our listeners find out more about you, about your books, about what you offer? All right. Well, I uh, invite everybody to go to my website. It's vibrantvocalpower.com because my goal is to help people come into the full power of their voices. So it's vibrantvocalpower.com. And when you get to my uh, website, you will see that there is a link. I have a complimentary report, Communicate with Confidence. And in there are 10 powerful pathways to overcome your public speaking fears, even if you've struggled with them for years. And uh, when I updated it, I added a, an 11th pathway, how to get your nerves to serve you instead of sabotaging you when you need to speak in public. Or pick up the phone or make a video, or go on audio, or go networking if we ever get back to networking, and uh, all the times when you communicate, and when you write something and put it out there, that takes courage as well. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Marjorie, for being a guest in Writing to Get Business. This podcast is devoted to helping people with their thoughts regarding writing a book, marketing a book, organizing a book, and seeing a book as a business tool that helps you expand your business with the content and the knowledge that you poured into your written material. So thank you for being one of our guests and being part of the show. It's been my pleasure to be so. And thank you to you who's either watching this on Pat Iyer's website. I have patire.com where I've got the audio files as well as a YouTube channel called Pat Iyer that has the video versions of these podcasts. We come to you every week with a new interview, an author who has gone through the turmoil, the trials, and the travails that Marjorie has done, I'm sure, in terms of putting together content that affects all of us as writers and she shared with you some valuable tips about not getting stuck in that editing phase when you should be in the creating phase. So be sure to come back next week for a new show, new topic, and thank you for being one of our devoted followers. This is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business, and I have with me Joanna Brandy. We've just finished a podcast on the subject of her three books, Joanna, welcome to the show, and please tell our listener what he or she will get from watching or listening to your podcast. Well, I think that they'll get a perspective that just because your first writing project doesn't turn out the way you thought doesn't mean you should quit. It means we could look at any project in a creative way and make the best of it and actually turn it into something that was better than anything you could have conceived of in the first place. Perfect. Be sure to listen to Joanna's podcast. That's Joanna Brandy and Writing to Get Business to get inspired and to get a perspective on what happens when you have the same subject matter, mm -hmm. but you keep morphing it and developing it and moving it into different directions and how each of those moves led to yet another book by Joanna. And another program. Each one of them kept, kept spawning new programs, so I was able to stay out on the speaking circuit with brand new material. Perfect. Even better. That's Even better. what writing to get business is all about. That's right. Thanks, Joanna. And thank you, Pat.